Um, we invited Dan Hartman, is a writer of film. He writes Wall Street Journal and various other publications, but we invited him mainly as a film and... <laughs> invited him as a film enthusiast to lead this conversation. Also, Ed Harris wanted to be here tonight, as we all marveled on that incredible performance, and he sends his best to these two. He couldn't, he really did try to come, but he's in the Southwest for uh, some other film engagement, but Ed Harris sends his best to Rudy and Alex. Ed who? <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm uh, Daryl Hartman. Thank you to Melissa and to Tony for inviting me up. It's a real honor to be here with two great uh, figures from film, specifically independent American cinema. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be talking to you guys. So uh, before we open it up to the audience for questions, I'm just going to have my own little moment here with these guys. Um, I see you guys as having this fantastically interesting relationship. And I'll preface that by saying when people talk about the history of American cinema, especially recent American cinema, there's this sort of turning point in the late 70s and early 80s where it went from this almost paradise of independent original filmmaking with great young voices making different and interesting sorts of movies. And it's commonly just sort of said that that changed around uh, 1980, there was a movie called Heaven's Gate that went way over budget, and there were things happening like Star Wars and Jaws, which were making a whole lot of money, and American movie making became much more about commercial films and blockbusters. Um, and so when I think about you guys, I see you sort of as meeting uh, from different sides of this great divide, where Rudy, you made a name for yourself in the 60s with some well-received novels, and in the 70s, doing the screenplay for Tulane Blacktop, one of the great sort of open-ended road movies um, from that 60s and 70s era, and having done the screenplay for Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, another sort of uh, Sam Peckinpah film, um, another totally free-spirited uh, uh, relic of that era. And then Alex, a similarly sort of... Uh, unconventional, original voice in filmmaking, but coming into it in the 80s when things had changed a bit. Um, Repo Man sort of making a name for you in 1984 and being just this sort of breath of fresh air as things had already started to turn into more conventional Hollywood films where the people making the big decisions were money men and not real sort of connoisseurs of film in any way. So anyway, that's my sort of take on you guys, but I wanted to ask you, having just sort of thrown it out there, how did you meet each other from sort of across this divide? Were you following each other's work? How did this relationship that we sort of uh, are able to have a look into right now, how did that start? Can you remember how we met? I, I have no memory. <laughs> no memory. I know it was a huge mistake. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we met in, uh, at a, at a uh, film thing in uh, Amsterdam. Rotterdam. 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 Can you hear us? Maybe hear the mic. Us? Pop, 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 pop. Uh, we met in Ro Rotterdam. It was a. Um, it's better. A film uh, festival. Film festival. festival. I, yeah. I forget why I was there. Probably hustling some feudal thing, you know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember I went into the bar of the Hilton Hotel in Rotterdam where they had put us, and I, cause, and I was there with my first film, which was Repo Man, and Harry Dean Stanton was also there as the lead actor of Repo Man. And Harry was sitting at the bar talking to somebody and he kind of looks at me and goes, eh, you know, and he goes, well, and he has to, obviously has to introduce me to the person he's talking to or he would be rude. And so he, and Harry would never be rude. So Harry says, this is Rudy. And I say, you must be Rudy Wurlitzer. <laughs> and and I that said, was it. No, no, I'm not Rudy Wurlitzer. <laughs> <laughs> and because I was a, Super fan of of, Pat, of 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 Tulane Blacktop and of Rudy's books and of Quake, um, but also of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. And because I was already thinking about Walker, it was meeting Rudy was like perfect, because both films are like companion pieces. And what we really should do, rather than see Repo Man after this, we should get the DVD of Pat Garrett and watch Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid after this, because the two go together like that. Walker and Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid are like a pair, I think. Don't you think? 
It's sort of, sort of, yeah. <laughs> I think they're a pair because you know what? Because I think that Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid is the most political Western that was yeah, ever that's made. That's true. It was very political, yeah. Yeah, because you see who the big players are. You see the, the Santa Fe Ring, you see Chisholm, you see um, uh, Lou Wallace, the governor of New Mexico. You see these kind of squirrely guys who've shown up to kind of promote the idea that Billy the Kid has to be caught and killed because he's a menace to progressive politics. And, um, and Walker the same. I mean, in both scripts, Rudy talks about the big players. You know, and involves Vanderbilt and Garrison and Morgan in the, in the drama. And I've never seen it. I mean, obviously, there was a Western called Chisholm with John Wayne, but that was just like a rancher movie, you know, the good rancher, the good Billy the Kid, the bad guys. Whereas Rudy actually talks about the kind of the socio-economic power structure which dominated all of these events. And the Western was a genre that had been pretty well insulated from any kind of political take, it seems to me. Only Rudy's scripts. Uh, right. Rudy's scripts are the only ones I know. And Italian, I mean, obviously some Italian Westerns sure. do it as well. But in terms of the American cinema, Rudy's the only filmmaker and writer who's ever dealt with the politics of it. And one of the, one of the remarkable things about Walker is the, um, the stridency of that political commentary. I think it really, I've never seen anything quite like it, especially in a... In oh, a, you think it's strident because you write for the uh, Wall Street Journal, yes. but it's not so strident. That's reality, you know. It's very strident directing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But check out, um, check out Pat Garrett because it's seamless. I mean, because I watched Pat Garrett this afternoon before we came. It's a seamless transition between Walker and Pat Garrett. You could almost say they're the same film, even down to having one or two of the same actors. And Rudy, I had a question for you because in your in your latest novel, um, The Drop Edge of Yonder, uh, Vanderbilt has a cameo in that as well. Yeah, uh, and Walker. So this is a figure who's of interest to you. Can you talk a little bit well, about what his role? Vanderbilt is? is is a big figure for me, but these figures come and go because mm. I uh, have very little imagination, so I have to use them again. You know. <laughs> well, you get to know them well. But uh, Vanderbilt was a big big figure for Walker because he represented uh, uh, a whole state of mind and uh, manifest destiny. And, you know, he was, in a way, uh, Reagan was an incarnation of him in a, some, some kind of way. But that m military industrial complex, that state of mind, that aristocracy of, of uh, noblesse oblige, you know, it was, uh, so he was, He's a very seminal figure for me in that way. And Walker and, and, and Ernesto Cardinal, the, the Nicaraguan poet, we're talking about him today as well, and he, he wrote uh, poetry about Walker and about the big, the big players. And he said, um, in one of, his, one of his poems he wrote, Rudy plays Garrison or Morgan. Like, we can't remember which character he plays, but he plays one of those big players. And uh, Ernesto Cardinal wrote in Spanish, but translated into English, what he wrote was, Garrison and Morgan knew what they were doing, and down in Nicaragua they made dollars off the dead. And of course that's what Halliburton and Brown and Root and, and all of these military industrial corporations like Boeing and, and Hughes are doing today. Yeah, that's true. I'm curious if you guys, or specifically you, Alex, perhaps, because you were in Nicaragua this, during the filming, obviously. Um, to me, it's an incredible situation to be in. You're in a country that is basically um, being invaded by the U.S. at this time, or around this time. Uh, you've got a decent budget to make a film that is ultimately uh, completely transgressive. Did you have a sense of how special this situation was at the moment, it's sort of unheard of to my mind. Th this was the, the only film that I wanted to make. I mean, Rudy and I met before I started work on Sid and Nancy, and Sid and Nancy didn't mean anything to me. I wanted to make Walker, you know? And so the great delight for me was having met Rudy, and so that even while we were working on Sid and Nancy, we, Rudy and I would get together in New York and we'd talk about the script of Walker. Um, so it was always about Walker. It was always about making a film in Nicaragua that dealt with those issues. Um, and what really drew me to, to Rudy as a screenwriter was the idea that both the protagonists of um, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid and the protagonist of Walker seek their own death. 
um, which Rudy makes very clear in, 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 in the original version of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Both of them are death-seeking, charismatic individuals, but before they can encounter their own death, they kill dozens of other people, you know. And, and Walker manages to escalate the, the, the body count to hundreds or thousands of people before he finally gets what he's been seeking. So I thought that Rudy was obviously the writer for it, you know. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. <laughs> oh, I think it's a compliment. That's a compliment. Yeah. You actually have a, there's a, I believe there's a decent story about the moment you decided you had to make this in Nicaragua. You explained before that there was a motivation to um, pour American dollars into this country at this, at this time. But you met some Nicaraguans at one point while you were down there who convinced you that you had to film in their country. Could you tell I, that I, I, Yeah, that's a, uh, th yeah, actually that's a, good, that's a good reminder because I had gone down in 1983 as a kind of volunteer election observer because after the, uh, the triumph of the, of the Sandinista revolution in 1979, um, Nicaragua had the first like free elections that country had ever had. And uh, there were people there from the European Union and people from other countries there as election observers and stuff. And I went down with another with a friend of mine from the US to, to just check it out, you know. And so um, on election day in 83, which is when the Sandinistas were democratically elected, um, we, um, we ended up in a hotel with a couple of guys who were veterans of the war that was already ongoing against the Contras. And um, these guys, you know, there, was, there, there were two guys who'd been invalided out of the Sandinista army because they were wounded. And so we were having a couple of beers with these guys and, and one of them said, well, why don't you come down here and make a movie? And my, I and my friend, who was a producer, we, we started to go, oh, well, you know, it's very difficult to make a film and, you know, it's hard to raise the money. And this guy goes, listen, man, don't give me any of that nonsense. We made a revolution here and we're really poor. You live in America, the land of money. Go back there, raise some money, come back here, spend it in Nicaragua, make a film and help us. And so that's, so I went, okay. Yeah, we, it know. was really Alex's enthusiasm and total obsession with Nicaragua that interested me and fired me up, you know, that he knew so much about what was going on down there. I didn't know anything until I had met him and started to read about it and get interested in, and uh, it was not just romantic, but it was something, it was a complicated obsession that we both developed over time, and then we sort of had to do it, you know. And so Rudy wrote the script for free, you know. I mean, we just pursued it and pursued it and hoped we could raise some money and hoped we could get it on and make it as a film. And, and we were very fortunate, you know. Did you, did you identify all of Walker Alex and try to organize this look like complete chaos around you? Like the, the critics of the film, like Roger Ebert and people like that, the people who, who hated the film and wished to see it destroyed, you know, after it came out, definitely would, I, they identified me with Walker. I think the difference perhaps is I'm not like deliberately a murderer, you know, <laughs> and I'm not entirely suicidal, you know, and other than that, yeah, quite similar. <laughs> um, so in, in writing the, the, the script with the dialogue, as well as in filming it, how do you balance the anachronisms of uh, contemporary culture at the time of culture <coughs> and Time magazine and then his speeches present the Reagan moments and then the 19th century dialogue that was that? I think the anachronisms came a lot uh, came forth kind of spontaneously. Uh, Alex would drop Time magazine into a scene and there we were, you know. So it sort of built into a bigger theme. It didn't start off that way, but in the in the process of the film, it it uh, it evolved towards making that kind of statement that you know uh, history repeats itself, and uh, you know it's a film, so it it got theatrical and dramatic, and who knows where it was going to go, you know. And, and, and there was this tendency at that time to make American films about the third world, like The Year of Living Dangerously or Salvador, where your hero would be an American journalist who went to the corrupt third world and witnessed these terrible events, you know, in which often our government was somewhat complicit. But, um, but the hero would be an American journalist, the good journalist, you know. And 
I think we both felt that was complete bullshit, you know. Um, that we're all complicit, everybody's complicit, there are no good guys. And so, rather than make this story from the point of view of Byron Cole, the good journalist, you know, who's betrayed by Walker, we felt Byron Cole was as bad as Walker. We felt they were all equally bad because they were all part of the same enterprise. And so, therefore, Walker became the protagonist. Because if you're going to tell the story, you might as well tell the story, you know, and not try and couch it for people in a kind of a, uh, an appealing and, and, and kind of, you know, less painful way. The most sympathetic characters in the film are the two women, I would say. Walker's love interests. Yeah. They're strong. They're smart. Yeah. I think that's right. They're survivors I think, in a way. Yeah. Or especially yeah. Doña Urena's. Uh, yeah. I think the two, of the, the, the two women are the most sympathetic characters, and also the Nicaraguan guy who, who represents the Contras, who is so disappointed after the Battle of Rivas because he realizes that, you know, in spite of his, his dream that, he, that the, the Europeans and the Americans are going to come and give civilization to, um, to Nicaragua, it's all, it's all gone pear-shaped. And that was an improvised thing, wasn't it? That, that guy was, did his thing. Yeah, that was. Marley Maitland was really great. Oh, was wonderful. And, and Blanca Guerra, they yeah. were absolutely wonderful yeah. actors and, and totally into the, the meaning of the film. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Did the film show in, in Monaco? Yes, yes, it was the second most popular film in Nicaraguan film history after The Sound of Music. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question. I, Alex, somewhere I read the other night about there was a, an attempt to show the film at the Havana Film Festival, and there was a great momentum behind it, and Universal was involved. But something weird happened. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, because I was going to... We were there. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. You, you, I, I can't quite remember. You I know what happened, because this is interesting, because I, I found out later what happened, because we took Walker to Havana in competition, we were in competition, and we thought, man, if we can't win a competition in Havana, we're never going to win one anywhere. You know? So we took the film to Havana, and I delivered it to the judges, personally, in the cans, and then we found out we were out of competition. We'd been taken out of the competition. What had happened was Universal, for the first time ever, had approached the Havana Film Festival and have said, we would like to officially enter one of our films in competition at your film festival, which was unheard of for an American studio because it was against the law because of the embargo. Universal breached the embargo with a film called Born in East LA, directed by Cheech Marin, right? And it was so funny, but the, but the deal was they had to take Walker out of competition to get the Cheech Marin movie. And what the Castro regime imagined was, this is the end of the film embargo. You know, the Americans love us at last. There are going to be American films coming in. We're going to have a good relationship with the Hollywood studios. But of course, it was a total scam. You know, what the Americans were doing was they were pulling Walker out of competition because they didn't want the film to get publicity or win a prize. And, they, and so there was no more universal involvement after that, you know. And so it wasn't that clever, though, how, the, how Universal Studios pulled this fast one on Fidel Castro, you know. I mean, they played him for a fool, you know. I don't think we had an actor in mind, did we? When we started, we didn't have any no, actor in mind, no, really. No, we were thinking of a lot of different people. And uh, that's how it worked out. Yeah, I mean, we were interested in a, a, an English or a Scottish actor called David Heyman. Um, Sean Penn really wanted to play the part, but he wouldn't read. And he seemed very young. Sean Penn was the first choice for yeah. a while, yeah. He was, for the studio or for the financiers, he was their favorite, but he wouldn't read, and he seemed so young. He was like a young boy, you know. Whereas Ed Harris had this kind of compelling aspect, and also Ed would read. You know, he would actually audition for it, you know. And so, and in those days, I think we were naive, and we felt that actors should audition for the part, you know. <laughs> Fancy that. Ed Harris is uh, a fairly big guy, Physically, I mean, and Walker in real life was something like five feet. He's a very small man. We would put him in the trench. We would dig a hole for Ed, you know, so he'd get smaller. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's an ama- I mean, it's an amazing performance. And, oh, it's uh, marvelous. He it's makes himself into that character. And you've seen Ed Harris in these other films, and you can't believe he's playing this character, who is a sort of yeah. small driven Puritan. Yeah. And again, it was his first lead role because before then, no, actually he'd been in a motorbike movie called Night Riders. But, um, but mostly he'd been kind of like bad guys and supporting characters. And um, it was his first kind of like yeah. big. And he, he really chewed role. it up. He really got obsessed yeah. and he became Walker actually. <laughs> Yeah, he was, he was he was very he's very impressive, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he cool. was, yeah. And you see it too in the um, in the Criterion DVD of the film. Part of the liner notes are actually Ed Harris's diary from the shoot. Yeah, yeah. and you yeah. can see he is just processing every moment of being there in yes. Nicaragua, what this yes. man is like. Yeah, he was very involved. Very yeah, involved. he was very involved. And Molly Matlin too. I mean, they were like very very into it. You know, very involved. And a lot of the actors were. I mean, obviously Cy Richardson, who plays Hornsby, and. Um, they became yeah. very associated with the project. Yeah. And Joe Strummer was and very, Joe Strummer. very yeah. It's a great soundtrack. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. And it was, Joe that what the, it was Joe that said that when the film was over, we shouldn't go back. Because the idea was we would return to London or San Francisco or somewhere and do the soundtrack and the editing there. And Joe said, no, we've got to stay here. Let's just stay here. We'll edit yeah. the film here. We'll, I'll compose the score here. You know, and we'll remain within the country because this is what it's all about, you know? And that was Joe that made that. That was Joe, yeah. 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 Great audio, huh? (laughs) You're coming for us. That's right. In a train. Pushing west. In a train, though. (laughs) In a train. Alex, I want to ask you something because you've said before, I think it's just sort of an offhand comment about the movie 300. You wish that uh, some of the... It's actually in the DVD commentary for, for this film. You said you'd wish some of the latent homoeroticism in that film had been brought to the surface more, which made me think of a question for you. If you could remake any of the sort of popular movies or blockbusters out there, which one would it be in your That's own style? Question. Um, no, I can't. I, if, I could do an, if I could do a film that I wanted to do, I would do one of Rudy's scripts. I would do like um, Slow Fade or Zebulon. You know, because the blockbusters are, eh, nice. you know. But, but Zebulon is a great script, and Slow Fade is a great script. So if I could have my druthers, I'd do another one of Rudy's. <laughs> he's a good writer. He's, he's, a, he's a, a, a jewel for this town. <laughs> he, he, he says that to all the scribblers. He's just trying to wind me up and... <laughs> So, along those lines, in this era of uh, the NSA spying on people and drone missiles, what would that really be? Which one? No. No, what would you do? Oh, Rudy, no, because Rudy's scripts, one of Rudy's scripts is about some guys who go on the, on the Dharma trail in India and, and all meet an unhappy end. And the other one is uh, a Western about mountain men. Set what in the 1880s? Yeah, 1880s. Yeah. A guy who spends a lot of time in jail and comes out. He has a bullet lodged in, next to his heart, but he wants to reunite with his family, and um, and indeed he does, and then disappears on a boat into the misty beyond. So, why don't you do it? I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. I just got to raise my. The, the problem is that Rudy doesn't want me to make it with hand puppets because that was my idea. I was, I was going to make it with, with like hand puppets riding on the backs of dogs. You know? And for some reason, Rudy didn't approve of that, of that notion. I've gotten over that. You can do it. <laughs> Any other questions? Better ask them now because this is the last, <laughs> the last opportunity. The last roundup. Rudy, are you still... Are you still oh, there we have one. Yes. I mean, I mean, not many people, but some people certainly. I mean, if you see a film, a good, you see a good film, it'll change your view of the world, or at least make you think about your view of the world, won't it? I, I think so. I'm not totally sure, but I think so. I hope so. I think so. I think if you see, like, The Battle of Algiers or something like that, or, yeah, or a really good film, you know, it'll make you think. And, and, and film, a good film, is an amazing thing, you know. What is the other thing? Uh, 
I think any film can do it. They don't. They but but it's not what they set out to do. It's what the what they do when they are finished, because. Many people set out to make an influential film or a cult movie. I mean, look at all the lame-ass, independent, would-be cult movies that the studios make and how they always fall on their ass and fail, you know. Um, so I think it really is the result of the film. You have to make the film and then see what happens. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, look at Pat Garrett and the, and the suffering of Pat Garrett, how the film was taken away from the director, was completely re-edited, the point of the film was lost, and yet the editor of the film, Roger Spottiswood, sneaked the director's cut out of the studio on the floor of his Volkswagen. And like 25 years later, they recut the film and, and represented it. And so you can now see a reasonably fair facsimile of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid as the dead director intended, you know. But that's only because they worked at it and worked at it over like a three yeah. decade period, right? They did, they, they were amazing. I, I've never heard of anything like that. Because, because they, they loved the film, film and they believed in it. Yeah. Do you think it's more difficult to make a film like Walter today than it was then? I mean, you know, if you get it wrong, it was better for the studios to be more able to... It would be impossible you to make a film You like couldn't that. make it now. No, it's a, it's a corporate game now on that level. Of because look at the films. Look, I mean, look at like films like um, the Ben Affleck film set in... Iran and the, the film by that idiot comedian guy on television, you know, that he directed also set in Iran, you know. Um, I forget his name. He's just directed a movie that's set in Iran and it's all propaganda against the... John Stewart. It's all against the Iranians, all against the regime, all about how we're good, they're bad, you know. And no, this was a rare opportunity that we had. I don't think of that opportunity will come again. What do you think? I, I think that's true. How did you get financing back then? How did you get the financing back then? That's four or five million dollars. Five point six. Five point six. Okay. That was just uh, through illusion and delusion. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, we were just lucky. <laughs> I, you know, in those days, it was more of a one-to-one -one thing in films. It wasn't so corporate, so you you could. Uh, find some weird guy that might give you the money or find a way to do it. But those days are over. Because it was a time, because the film that Rudy made with Universal Tulane Blacktop and the film that I made with Universal uh, Repo Man both had reputations in spite of the studio not liking them and trying to suppress them. Both those films had lives, you know. And so I think maybe the fact that we were doing this together you know, studio executives are terribly square, you know, no matter how many drugs they take, you know, and how many parties they go to, they're terribly square, bogus individuals, and they seek authenticity, you know. And so I think the fact that we were doing Walker together, perhaps that was a way for universal executives to show how hip they were, you know. But of course, then they were punished and didn't do it again. And on paper, it has some elements that some deluded executives could see as, uh, as uh, I don't know, maybe more mainstream or something, whatever they're looking for. It's, it's got fighting, it's got uh, sex, it's got an American main character. We wouldn't yeah. call him a hero. <laughs> yeah. But do you, do you think they thought they were getting something else than they the, got in the, the end? The script was, very, it was different in a sense because the, the actual shooting of the film and we we introduced all these other elements that futuristic and that no. they never would have gone. They didn't see that coming. That, that would, that but would, no, I think, but no, they did. I mean, the film is a fair fact because that was the thing. If we had changed the film, yeah. they wouldn't have had to take delivery. They could have refused to take delivery and we would have owed them the budget back. So the film is a really fair facsimile of the screenplay. You know, so they couldn't kind of complain, oh, we didn't know this was coming, you know, because they did know. Well, they didn't know the helicopter was coming. Yes, it was in the script. It is? Yes, of course the helicopter was in the script. Oh. <laughs> and, the fi and, the, and the movie ends, the sc Rudy screenplay ends at the Sheraton in Miami, right? With Walker making a speech to Contra supporters. That's you know, true. Yeah, and all the old kind of beaten up immortals who've managed to stagger back are like having a demonstration outside. And the speech that Walker gives in the cathedral was originally set in the Sheraton, Miami, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. His idea. <laughs>
He's responsible, though. <laughs> so, uh, in the of mind, it's only if you don't find that some of the technological breakthroughs that kind of make it more economical, or just, you know, get to a pure story, minus the special effects, you can't just you know, get a video, uh, uh, you know, uh, capture in the discussion here. I mean, 25 years ago, it would be Oh, I think that's right. The technology is much more readily available to many more people than it was when we were shooting on 35 millimeter exclusively. But it's distribution that's the issue. Because as long as the studios have a lock on theatrical distribution, how do you get your film distributed and how do you, how do you, how do you get a return on your investment? How do you pay your actors? That's the hard part. Yeah, that's true. I was trying to get the chronology here. This movie came out in 87, is that correct? Say again? This movie came out in 1987, is that right? And that was around the time they ran Contra Scandal broke, if I recall. Or what was the, which came first, the movie or? You'd have to Google it. You'd have to do it on that social media. That, 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 that didn't inspire the movie anyway. That, no, because we, we, yeah. we started working on the movie in 1983, 84, 84. But the coincidence that right after this I think it happened after the film came out, I believe, but Google what? would probably know. The Iran, or the Iran oh, Contra yeah, scandal after, came out, after, yeah. became public, I believe after, but certainly, Nick, yeah, interesting. And that was time. another brilliant move on the part of the, the, the powers that be because they were able to convince the Iranians that, like, yeah, if you help us, we'll be your friends, you know. And so the Iranians gave them all this money and funneled all these arms into Central America, and then we screwed them again. Have you, have you seen any contemporary films that sort of give you hope that uh, there are still original, sort of challenging American movies being made and that can get out there? American or? movies, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, can't th I can't think of one. Either. I've seen like three, sure there are some, uh, three good films so far this century. Um, <laughs> a film called Holy Motors. Oh, yeah. It's a French film. Um, a film called Ora Cero, yeah. Zero Hour, which is set in Caracas and, take, and is gangsters taking over a hospital. And a film, a British film called uh, A Field in England, black and white film set in the English Civil War, um, w which is very, very interesting. So I've seen three good films, but, yeah. they're, not, they're, but they're all foreign films. I mean, I see that, that too. Because of technology being like allowing people to have more accessibility to filmmaking, would you not think that maybe documentaries being able to have like a higher production value are kind of the new avenue of making really powerful cinematic filmmaking? Yeah, I think, I mean, and for a while, documentaries were actually playing in the cinema, weren't they? I mean, there was a period where, you know, maybe it's about 10 years ago now, but documentaries, you know, like, starting with March of the Penguins, but other things too. I mean, documentaries actually made it into the, the cinema, which was pretty amazing. Yeah. That was pretty exciting. And we were talking about films being able to really influence the way people see the world. And, and to me, two of the films that have had the biggest impact in that respect have been documentaries. Uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 and Inconvenient Truth are often pointed to as hugely successful documentaries that took a strong stand on the way the world works. That's true. Have you seen Loose Change? No. What's Loose Change? Anybody seen Loose Change? Loose Change. You've seen it, uh, right? Okay. <laughs> Check it out. It's online. Just go check. Just go do an internet search for loose change and what that. Watch that. See what you think of that. But that's great. I mean, that you, you can say that's online. I mean, that's that's a new thing. You yes. can tell someone this is a great film. You should see. It maybe didn't get the distribution that it should have gotten, but it's online and you can go yes. see it. And if it's a documentary, because the thing about documentaries is maybe it doesn't need to be monetized. Maybe the documentarian can be so generous that they make the film and just put it online and make it available. Well, I think it's also about Nobody's seen Loose Change? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple of you see that. Okay. We all need to, you need to be aware of Loose Change. You need to be aware of it. Because you live in New York, right?
For, the, for those who weren't here yesterday, and we talked about you being a teacher of film in Colorado, sort of what are you telling a 23-year-old American who's studying film, having been through the journey you've been through, having, you know, facing the facts that there is no financing for good original films in this country unless you steal the money yourself or make it on a little handheld thing and crowdsourcing. Yeah, those you know, and then yeah. there's the gap is distribution, so there's like almost no hope, but there is the internet and all these strange variables. What do you I mean, as a teacher, do you feel like it's your what is your stance when you're talking to like a hopeful person who wants to make movies their lives? Like do you just sort of get in a dialogue and I mean or is there what do you tell them? I encourage them to stay together and keep making films together because right. you're much better off in a group. Yes. And we were very fortunate because we, stayed, we, were, a, we were a partnership, you know. Um, Rudy and I and Lorenzo O'Brien, who's the producer, you know, we were partners in this, you know. And so we all moved forward together, you know. And we knew that we had, we had in, in, in Lynn Davies a great photographer who would, who would be with us on set, you know. We knew actors that we could work with and so we were kind of like a little unit. And so I try and encourage people to stay together as a group. And don't think that you can go alone to Los Angeles and win a heroic struggle. You know, it's much better if you stay together in, in Hudson or in Colorado or wherever you're based and make a film that you're actually interested in, you know, um, as, a, as a unit, as a group. Um, and then when you've done that, then at least you've got a piece of work, right, that, yeah. you, can, that you can share with others. And that might be the future of all things. <laughs> in terms of sticking together, building the community, uh, yeah. I think that's right. It's local rather than multinational. Um, and, the, and, if it's, and if it's local and it's good, then maybe it'll go wider. Yeah. It could be a very nice note to end on here in Hudson, New York. <laughs> yeah, the, good uh, luck, Hudson. Venue Hudson. devoted to artistic collaboration. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Let's get a drink. Hey, Daryl, welcome. Thanks for coming back.